Welcome to Graded Podcasts. Brendan Kelly is a contemporary Australian artist. He trained as a graphic reproducer and also worked as a stand-up comedian. His work evolved into distinctive painting style, which encapsulates elements of his character and life experiences. Through his art, he aims to create a unique and exciting experience that evoked contemplation of life while sharing his own experiences and eccentricities as an Australian. He has won many awards for his art, which is why he inspires me with it, as well as showing driven individuals in the world how to use your passion in order to become someone who makes a difference. Welcome, Brendan. Thank you for joining me on Greater Podcast. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Could you tell us a bit about your childhood and your environment growing up? Ah, uh, my childhood. Okay, so I grew up in an area in Sydney, Australia, and that area had been uh, orchards and and farmland. And then after the Second World War, that area was um, developed for low-cost housing for a lot of returned servicemen, um, Navy, Army Navy, and and so there was what was what was orchards and rural farmland suddenly became suburban uh, cul-de-sacs little dead-end streets and, and all brand-new houses, and a lot of them were built by um, Italian immigrants and, and, and the orchards, were they, they were owned for 100, 100 years or so, a lot of Italians. So I grew up in this suburban, um, so there was still a lot of, a lot of orchards and bush and, and farm, but there was these really dense um, housing estates. And so it was, and, and, and everyone had children. Every, every house had two to five children. And I was one of three in, in, in our family. And so there was just children everywhere, riding skateboards, riding bikes, billy carts, um, and, and just out on the street all the time. In, in just around where I grew up, there would have been 30 children, you know, all my neighbours, there would have been 30 children. You were all girls, boys, a mixture between, say, five and 13 years old, all playing together. So I, I, I'd say my childhood was um, a suburban an ideal suburban situation, yeah. You brought up your family and siblings. How did your parents play a role in you becoming an artist? Were they supportive of it? Um, uh, they, they, yeah, they, in their way, they were. See, when I when I left high school, I left high school uh, when I was fifteen, and it was I was I actually had an apprenticeship as a bricklayer, and. And, and and I already had that apprenticeship. And just, just before I left high school, I suddenly felt this feeling that I wanted to be an, what I thought was an artist, and that was essentially a, an illustrator. And I just I just felt it so strongly, and I I refused to go to, to work as a bricklayer the first day. And um, so, but then because I'd, I'd left school when I was only fifteen, I had no, I had no body of artwork. I had no training. So in Australia, then in, this was in the mid eighties. You were never going to be getting a job, in, 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 in some sort of an artist. So, so, but yeah, but mum and dad still, you know, they, 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 they. They, they were, you know, fairly supportive, but they, they didn't really know maybe what the, what the channels were or the paths, the conventional paths that would have got got me into art. So, yeah. So, but yeah, my parents were really supportive and still are, and, and they actually still live in the same house that I grew up in. Oh, well. You, you brought up the fact that your first job was as a bricklayer. How would you describe your career progression? 
Oh, okay. So I was always a little frustrated. I, I, um, so I went from that. I went from. I left high school. I got a job in graphic arts, but it was in the printing industry. And then the printing industry was very quickly becoming digital and computerized. And I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to sit there at a keyboard staring, <laughs> doing what we're doing now. I didn't want to sit there staring at the screen and having a keyboard and 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 all that. And and so I, I left. I left that. My first job in in the graphic arts industry in printing. I left that after six months. And then I got a job as a landscape gardener and outdoors, building stone walls, um, brick paving, building timber decks, working around swimming pools, tiling plants, steps, retaining walls. And so that was, although it was a very physical job, it was a very creative job and really suited me at that time. And I didn't really realise at that time that I, I, I was actually doing an artistic um, um, job and um, and I did an apprenticeship as a landscape gardener and got my trade certificate and then I went into business for myself all through my 20s I was uh, and, and even very early 30s I was uh, working as a landscape gardener yeah building walls and stuff so and then that ran its course and um, I actually then got into stand-up comedy. And so for the next 10 years, like all through my 30s up to when I turned 40, I was working um, as a stand-up comedian uh, in Australia, all the clubs in Australia, pretty much I'd be doing oh, you know, three, four, five gigs a week in stand-up clubs all over the place and um and I make I was making a living out of that and then and then in the day there's a lot of waiting around when you when you're a comedian you're waiting until night time until you have the show and I'd be sitting around with other comedians and they're, they're watching DVDs and you know whatever they're doing but they're not doing much you're just pretty much killing time and then I started drawing because I had always drawn I'd always drawn stuff and so then I started drawing cartoons which I could see oh as a stand-up comedian I, I could be doing cartoons and you could be putting out books and you could be doing t-shirts and poster art and stuff like this so so then I'd be drawing cartoons in a day and they would be going to magazines and newspapers and things and I'd be getting paid for them too. So, yeah, went, I went to stand-up and then into the cartooning and then the cartooning was the next point where I, that headed into fine art, so the large-scale painting and stuff that I do now, that, that, that came from essentially from comedy turned into cartoons, turned into paintings, yeah. If you weren't an artist, what career do you think you'd be involved in? Oh, I've, I've actually, um, I had that. I, at one time I had a, I, I had a, 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 it was like a question, if you had, if you could have five other lives, what would they be? And my, I remember, this was maybe 15 years ago, if you could have five, you're only wanting one, but I, I remember, it's the same sort of question, and I remember going like, well, one, my first one was always a hermit. I've always had this dreamy idea. I've always had this dreamy idea about myself. I got this book once. It was about Chinese hermits in like hundreds of years ago and living in caves and, and med meditating. It's all, it's, 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 they're Taoist and um, they're her Buddhist hermits and stuff. So I always had this kind of dreamy idea about being a hermit. And then also a sculptor is another one, I, a, a sculptor. And I, I do do some sculpture stuff, but like a real Leonardo da Vinci sort of um, or Michelangelo chipping away at a block of um, 
um, granite, that type of sculptor, uh, that was one. Um, maybe what's another one? Or oh, a painter. At the time, yeah, I said painter, and I do, and I and I do do that now. So the painter is an obvious one. So all of always, it, if I was doing something else, it would still be an artisan. Uh, an artisan. Um, I could be. I could see myself working with metal or glass or. But the hermit one, the hermit one's the odd one out where my hermit fantasy, I actually don't do anything. I personally like your art. How do you define your art? What is your preferred medium? Oh, how do I define my art? I guess I'd say it's um, it's figurative, figurative meets abstract. Um, poor, cause, because it's multimedia and it's actually growing all the time where I've started to allow for more um anything is in so i'm i'm okay with photo collage and re- realism abstract I'm, everything's in so to i have to say it to define it i'd say it's a multimedia art practice probably or more in line with like a late 60s or early 70s pop artist you know, they were doing everything I'm doing, sort of thing. I mean, yeah. So uh, that's that's where I that's where I guess I am. You described your art as growing. How would you compare your art today to when you started? Ah, uh, well, okay. Well, when I started, it was the cartoon stuff, so it was black and white. I was using just uh, an art line ink pen. Um, it was basically all line work and it was humorous with a, a, a caption of some sort. And now it's large scale um, paint. It's colourful. It's sometimes, it's definitely not always huge. I do have elements of humour often crop up, but a lot of my art is a lot more serious now and it's also research based. I like, I like the, um, you know, historical content, looking into a subject matter of some sort. The stuff I'm doing at the moment is about the history of asylums in Australia uh, and leading you to a contemporary um, issue of um, mental health. Um, so, yeah, I, I, uh, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, it was, we were talking about how's it changed. Yeah, okay. So I went from very simple line drawings that were essentially uh, gags or jokes or cartoons and now it's uh research-based historical subject matter large-scale colorful multimedia it's a fair it's quite different than it was the value of art is often influenced by the artists who created it how do you recommend aspiring artists build their brand as artists to get noticed and get higher value from their art uh, well, one thing I think to, to get higher value for your art, I think it, that that side of it I leave to the gallery. So I, I'm represented by several galleries uh, in, and, and then it's the gallerist who is um, setting your price and pushing your price up. So I I find I find I concentrate on creating the art and then that 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 the money side of things that's the business side that's the gallerist's um work and also as an artist I find I I I never found it I never found it easy to push my price up you know, anyone who would approach me wanting to buy a painting, I'd suddenly be almost giving it away, going, oh, no, it's okay, it's okay, you know, like this, which is just insane. And uh, so you so you need you need to have someone representing you who's who's talking you up and and um and and doing that. And and also the uh, pushing your brand sort of thing. I struggle with that too. I much more find I go better if I just focus on the creative side, the production of the paintings, and that I tend to kind of hope for, and it does happen, that that people then contact me wanting to sell that or promote me. So I don't, I don't, 
I don't do a real lot of self promotion at all. I I find it. I, I think whenever any of that sort of stuff, I think no, I'm here to I'm here to be in the studio creating this stuff, and someone else can. You know, yeah, do the interviews or do the do the do the promotion. Yeah. Did you ever worry that art may not be your main income? Because I know a lot of artists who are struggling. Um, well, I always I always like most, I always wanted I always I think pretty much anyone one who starts to who gets this feeling, oh, I want to draw or I want to paint or I want to make things. And I want to, and that's all I want to do. I want to do that all day long, and and then, then you're immediately up against. Okay, so I have to be making a living out of this. So we all, we all, we all, um, yeah, from the get go, you're pretty much up against this. I want to be making a living out of this, so I have to be making money from this. So how do I make money from this? And um, again, we luck like for me. Sometimes those things I haven't really had to try too hard, um, even like with the simple cartoons 25 years ago or, yeah, 25 years ago, um, that I, I sent some off to magazines and newspapers and they immediately said, oh, okay, yeah, well, and we'll pay you some money. But so, so, so I always kind of found that I fell into... Um, I, I never was struggling too bad. Uh, well, then, but having said that, I, I, I like when I was doing stand up comedy and cartoons, I wasn't making a hell of a lot of money out of it. I was making a living out of it, but I certainly was no rock star. <laughs> I'm going to change the topic to how art influences individuals. How is art important to society, in your opinion? Oh, okay. Um, Oof. How is art important to society? Well, I mean, look at things. I'm just reading a book at the moment about Leonardo da Vinci. So, I mean, in in, in those days, so you're going back to the 1400s, that art was all about, well, it was about religion in a big way. It was also about maybe um, honouring of leaders. They could be... Um, um, They've fought wars and things, so art would be honouring things, and so it could be. Yeah, it have that means it's got a historical content there, so uh, the public is learning from art as well as appreciating art. Um, I think that art in in this day and age, I think that art probably uh, we that we all we all need we all need to um, a release from 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 our lives from from from. It's also great with social media too that so many people can see art and see a really diverse range of art you don't have to go to an art gallery anymore you can you know look at your phone sort of thing it's never as good but yeah and and also even just things like memes uh where anyone now can 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 create uh and have a voice and they can be really powerful and they can really hit a bullseye sometimes it doesn't matter who you are you can so 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 art in this day and age i think can be from the, the, just the average lay person can 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 create something and, and reach a lot of people, or it can be a lot more of a serious fine art or, or something, and, and and large scale sculpture, conceptual stuff. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. I get. I tend to get off track and then forget what the question was. It's all right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> You discussed in the previous question that as a comedian you weren't earning a lot of money. What is your personal definition of success? Oh, okay. So that's that one where, yeah, very subjective. I think the what is success for anyone is a, is a subjective question. I think I think probably the average person these days is is caught up with the success equals money, fashion, clothes, um, fancy cars. Um, but I think maybe the success is if I'm, if I, well, to a degree, if you're making a living out of your art, okay, so now you've got that covered. You don't have to have another job or anything. You, you, you're, you're, if you're making a living out of that art and it's covering your, your life, 
and you're inspired, you're motivated, you've 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 got you, you curiosity and, and you've got that and you've you found your audience and you're sort of happy with your work. That's what I'm so I'm saying success for me is that that I'm for one making a living out of my art. Two that when I go into the studio, I'm ex- I'm excited. It's not drudgery. I'm not I haven't sort of cornered myself into having to maybe knock out I don't know it might be hundreds of paintings of something where you go you know I I actually don't like these I know they sell well but I'm so sick of doing this yeah success for me would be going into your art studio day after day you're excited you're motivated you're inspired that's success you discussed that the average person sees success as money. I think that the school system almost teaches us that it's money, which isn't always correct. How critical was the school system in making you a successful artist? Mm, well, I went to a Catholic. I went to a Catholic boys' school. I went to a uh, Maris Brothers school. Yeah, and so I don't really. I don't think then when I went to high school, I don't think. Oh, I don't think they really pushed for any. I don't think school for me really pushed any. Um, I mean, typically, typically, typically in in an Australian school, they were pushing you to get a, as high a mark as you can in the. It's called the HSC. So if you went to Year Twelve in Australia and you did the HSC. They were so success would be as high a mark as you can get in the HSC. Therefore, you have lots of options about what you. So, so if you got a high mark in the HSC, oh, you could go into law, you could become go into me- medicine. You had lots of options, but that doesn't cater for what. What do you feel in your heart? What do you want to be? And in my situation. Because I didn't do the HSC, I let I didn't go to year twelve. I left school two years earlier than that. I was I, I was a school leaver, and there that was you were very much. I was very much. If you were a school leaver in year ten, as I did, you were kind of a bit of a black sheep anyway. So they were sort of, you know, he he. I, I was one. I, I was almost like a. They failed in their failed in their mission because I because because I left you know I probably shouldn't have left school having having done that um I I I only left school in year 10 to because I was you know at loggerheads with my parents about the school they sent me to (laughs) I didn't want to I didn't want to go to a Catholic boys school so I was adamant from year seven from when I was 12 I was adamant that I was going to leave the day I can leave I'm going to leave and I did and I really shot myself in the foot doing that I I, I gave myself very few options and um and 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 gave myself few options to to find the job and the life that I was suited to which is to me, as I just said, success. So, yeah, so the school system for me, um, their, their, their idea of success was just as high a mark as you can so you've got as many options as you can and that's it, you know. How do you think leaving school influenced your drive for success? Well, leaving school, so um, I was really, really keen. Um, I was, I was always just itching to be making, to have a job, and to be making money, and to be. I got this idea when I was probably sixteen or seventeen. Didn't take me long after leaving school that I had this idea about that I, I wanted to build a, a, a an owner built. Um, earth house, like a mud brick house, and make your own bricks out of earth, and and you could be, it'd be really cheap, and you'd build it all yourself. And I did that, and I did that, and I did that, I did that when I was twenty two years old. So so when I was twenty two, I actually had saved up enough money because I'd been out of school since I was sixteen. So so by the time I was twenty two, I'd saved up enough money to to. Um, buy uh, a block of land. I bought eight acres, and and I built 
this house on my own, a, a mud brick house, and it was council approved and everything. And and I and so so I was just always I was just always itching to be earning money so that I could pretty much leave the city and go and live in the country. And that was all very much influenced by the Morning of the Earth surf movie. It was all influenced by surf. Was, um, was, hey, they go to they go to um, they go to South Africa in Morning of the Earth too. But um, so I so I, I was really influenced by Morning of the Earth, and it was all this like leave the city, uh, grow your own food, build your own house. Real hippie, real hippie values. But you know, I wasn't of that time. I mean, I was born. I was born when when the hippie sort of um, revolution happened. So so by the time I was twenty two years old, that was nineteen ninety two, and I and I and I saw this surf movie, and and yeah, that just inspired me to um to leave the city and and uh, yeah, build build this. Yeah, I forget what the question was again. <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> hey good cool <laughs> we're together on this one <laughs> yeah um i find it extremely interesting that you actually built a house how long did that how long did that take you um that took uh, oh well i was 22 i already had one child right so i was 22 i already had i already had a daughter and then while i was building the mud brick house and we were so there was me, my partner, that was Tanya, and my daughter. We were living in a caravan under a tree with no power, no water or anything. And then and then Tanya got pregnant again. And that was like, yeah, I did it. It was me. <laughs> and then so then she was pregnant again. So then so then it was just totally me building the house. But I built it, uh, I think it took eight, eight months. Eight months, and then we moved in, and it was really quite a desperate rush. Where Tanya was getting bigger and bigger and bigger with our second child, and I, we just had to get out of that caravan. And I'm six foot; I'm nearly six foot four. Like I'm a tall guy, and this caravan, I couldn't. You couldn't even stand up in the middle of it. So. So you, I could just like stand up in, in inside it. My head would be touching the roof, but then the roof sloped down. So to, I'd have to like crouch down, crouch down like this, and I was just dying to get out of that caravan. So yeah, we got in. So we got into the mud brick house, and that took um, and that took yeah eight months, and then we were in. Yeah, I did it pretty quick. Oh, the house I'm in now, I, I built this one too. Yeah, and all those skills. They although it was landscape gardening. Um, I, I learned all the skills to build a house um, from from my landscape gardening trade. Yeah. Have you bought all the houses you've lived in? Uh, yeah. I, no, I, I I I did buy. A, I lived in a house. I've built I've built two of the houses that I live in. I built my studio as well. My studio that, that's here on this property. My studio is actually bigger than this house. It's it's like it's grown and grown and grown. So so my studio's got more uh, covered um, covered area than 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 this house. So it's a pretty big studio. I'm gonna change the topic to role models. Who are your role models or the people you followed and looked up to during your teenage years and build up to becoming the success you are today? Oh, teenage. Okay, through my teenage years, who were my role models? I think I think my role models in my teenage years. Um, <laughs> I, I wish, I wish I did, I wish they, they were all just stereotypical stuff like, you know, rock stars. I, I used to like, actually, there used to be the, 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 the guy, the, um, um, the British, um, interviewer, Michael Parkinson. So you, the, the Parkinson show would come on like on a Friday night or something and he would, he would interview interesting people as he always did. And I'd always find I resonated with a lot of actors. I would say so like Michael Caine. So that's one that comes to mind. And I'd, and I'd, and, and so sometimes actors, I would just, I would see that, oh, I would think that they were, they were quite well rounded people. They'd seen a lot. So, so actors would be um, maybe a role model. Other thing is, I think when I was a teenager, 
I played I played rugby union and I played rugby league. And so very much your coach becomes a, a quite a role model and quite a mentor. And um and where I where I lived, there was a lot of Italians, as I said before, but there was also a lot of Maoris, New, New Zealand Maoris. And there and so we had this football coach that he was a huge guy. His name was Lenny Piopa. And he was probably about 23, 24 stone. He was a huge man, but he was really, really gentle. And and so he he was our football coach for maybe, I don't know, six years or something. He was a big influence for me. And 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 his influence was actually um uh came through um I mean, a lot of lot of Maoris and a lot of Pacific Islanders are um, uh, like Seventh Day Adventists, and so he was. I didn't even know it at the time, but he was a Seventh Day Adventist. So he had kind of morals and things that have he's picked them up through Christianity. And although I went to a, a Catholic boys' school, I'm not Catholic. And the, we, mum and dad, we never went to church or anything like that. No, we had nothing to do with religion. And and I, and yeah, but that that football coach Lenny Piopa, Maori, uh, New Zealand Maori, and Seventh Day Adventist. Yeah, I could see he was a big and and I could see he he kind of like uh, he, so a football teams like 15, 20 guys, and then he's gone. Oh, I can affect these boys in a positive way and he very much did you know yeah what qualities are lacking amongst today's leaders oh amongst oh okay what qualities are lacking i'd say um well you know the virtue the virtues compassion um compassion honesty compassion virtues of, of like it I mean, it'd be good if it'd be good if today's leaders all practice martial arts or something and and and, and you know there, there you go back to the hermits in it used to be like in ancient china that comes out of that hermit book in back in ancient china to to be a leader of people you had to have done some time like as a hermit on your own meditating and gaining some sort of insight or wisdom and now you can be a leader so essentially you, you, you had to have you have to have had some wisdom to lead people and that's what i think um today's leaders often have gone through a school system and then they've been funneled into the political um system and they aspire to being you know the leader and I don't think they have uh, a solid. Um, they don't have a solid. Um, they don't. They don't have the wisdom, and they don't have the virtues and the pillars that we need. So yeah, essentially, I think modern leaders are. Um, uh, you know, they're on a. They're on a. They're, 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 it's an. It is an ego thing. They. They want to be sort of a rock star politician, and um, and they don't have the foundation. Yeah. You've mentioned more than once now that the hermits meditate. Do you meditate? Um, no, that's it's good. Yeah, you'd think you think I would. Um, man, I got way too. I'm way too like like I, I could be sitting there to do practice sitting meditation. And for a long time, I used to do a martial art called Aikido. And in Aikido, um, there's a lot of um, there's sitting meditation at the end of the class and things and yeah you should go home and, and have sitting meditation and then as an aspect of your life and maybe do it every morning and then yeah I've got a pretty fast going mind and stuff and so I could be sitting there and um, practice sitting meditation one time I remember and then the next thing I was out in the shed I, w I was out in the shed and I was doing something and then I went <laughs> Oh man, not only have I like, you know, gotten lost in thought, I've like left the whole room and I've left the house and it was, I'm like five, it took me five minutes to realise like it's a bit of a monkey brain thing really, isn't it, you know? Anyway, so then, not, knocking, so then, not knocking monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so then <laughs> how do you stay motivated? <laughs> Oh, uh, well, that's not um, motivate. I think, okay, for me, motivation comes from inquisitiveness. So looking into 
looking into um, I go well with themes and like I said I go well with uh, looking into maybe historical themes um, uh, typically for me Australian history uh, 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 the last 200 years and also indigenous history love that too um, but but so so I go stay motivated by by looking into and being inquisitive and picking up things. It's like walking along the beach or something and picking up shells and then going through the forest and picking up sticks and flowers and things. And so 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 motivation for me comes from maintaining a um, inquisitive. Um, and keeping the excitement there and um, also motivation maybe. I like to have a purpose, so uh, working towards th- the next exhibition, knowing knowing that these paintings or drawings are going to be exhibited. I, 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 I can lose motivation and focus if I feel like there's no purpose, so a bit like... Uh, a bit like like a you know a, a, a dog that rounds up sheep or a working dog that rounds up cattle or a farm dog you know I'm like that I've got to have a job you know a purpose so purpose is motivating for me yeah and do you find being an artist stressful how do you handle stress and pressure um well so when I would be when I was a stand up comedian. That's extremely stressful, waiting backstage, listening to the crowd, waiting to go on. Now, you are in a state before that, and and but I kind of would be, I would throw, I thrived off that at the adrenaline, the pacing around, and then hyping yourself up, and so so stand up comedy world that I was in. That's extremely stressful. And so now the fine art world, that's nothing compared to that. Although maybe just before an exhibition or something and you, oh, I hope people come and I hope they like it and everything, that is stressful um, to a degree. But, um, yeah, it can get a bit snappy or something. Um, that stress works on me like that where I can get a bit, bit, bit snappy or something with people around me get a bit hypersensitive but I guess as I as I mature I may be able to manage that a bit more but um but other but like during the week or something I'm not stressing out about money or because 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 I because I own my prop own my property and I, I don't have a mortgage and I don't pay rent so I've a lot of artists, they pay rent, say, and they rent their studio or they have a large mortgage to pay for their house. And so that's stressful for them. But I, I actually, for a long time, because I saved up when I was in my teens and dropped out of the city and bought a house in the country and then I owned it, I didn't have um, I didn't have that stress, you know. So yeah, so so I don't so I admit day to day working as an artist, I, there's I'm not stressful, not really. And what has been your lowest point, and how did you get from there to where you are now? <laughs> my lowest point, I remember that. You know what my lowest point was? Again, it came in. Oh man, I had some low one. I had some low points when I'd be doing um, stand up comedy. Oh my god, mate. Um, uh, really low points. This girl got on stage once, and I tried to get her off stage, and 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 I pushed her, and she fell backwards onto a table, onto a table full of people who were eating. So they had plates and glasses of wine, and there was candelabras and things, and she fell. And and there was a big crowd too. It was like four hundred people, and they all just wanted to kill me. And it just looked so bad. It looked—it was the worst look ever. So that was like, and hey, that isn't even my lower. That's that's just that's just that's just an average one. <laughs> I had, but my lowest. I reckon my lowest. The one I remember when I just went, oh man, this has got to be my lowest point of my life. Was it was um, I, I was doing stand up, and it had arranged to do this. Um, 
they have the Australian, they have the Melbourne Comedy Festival, uh, International Comedy Festival, and you can and you can arrange to get a venue and 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 and, and then you, you you're doing a, a gig every night for a month, and so I arranged all this, I arranged all this stuff, and then. Um, went, <laughs> flew down to Melbourne, went to the venue, which was like a bar, and knocked on the door and knocked and knocked and knocked. And finally, someone, o- it was in the afternoon, and finally, someone opened the door. And this guy says, Yeah, what? And I said, Oh, I'm, I'm Brendan, you know, I'm here about the, to do the comedy shows. And, and he just looked over his shoulder and went, Hey, Barry, is that, it's the comedian and the guy in the background and the guy in the background goes it yeah no nah, I'm not going to do it anymore don't worry tell him don't worry about it and then the door just shut in my face and I'm just and I'm standing there on the street and I've flown all the way to Melbourne and I've, and I'm I'm like meant to be doing a month of gigs and they've just like and they've just like tossed me out like a piece of garbage and I remember that. I remember that was that was. I remember that walking away from that. I just went, "Oh man, this is. It doesn't get lower than this, surely, does it? You know." And, and uh, <laughs> but hey, you know those all those all those low points. Um, as long I always got back up, like Evil Knievel. Just watched the doco about Evil Knievel. You know the American stunt rider. He always got back up. I must say. So like, like Evil Knievel, I think I always, I always get back on my feet. When you push that lady off the stage, how do you, how do you deal with that? Did you just walk off? Or how oh did man, you? They, 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 <laughs> well, when she went off, when she went off, mate, the crowd was going to kill me. And then my friend, it was my, my friend who, who it was his gig and he was the MC. And um, he just kind of like moved me through the crowd, and we went through like a, you know, you got like a fire exit, you got an exit sign, and it was like a door that you go through it, and then it shuts. So he just kind of pushed me through this door, which then had me in this backstage corridor, and then these bouncers came and walked me through the building. And then open this other door, which put me out on the street in the, at like ten o'clock at night. And then they just went, "You're on your own, mate," and just shut the door on me. So, so how did I get out of that one? It was pretty much just trying to get back to my car and um, get out of there, which I did. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. I, fo- I find these stories hilarious. Do you have any other funny oh, stories you can share? They are. They're great. They're great now. They're great now. At the time, do you know what? When that happened, when that happened that night, I remember I went. I went out. When they put me out onto the street, I then I remember I just walked over to this fence and just leaned over it, and I was just and I was vomiting. I was, I was physically it, it, I, the whole experience was so fast and so ugly and so volatile. And and so many people hated me and wanted to kill me at once. Yeah, way more than usual. And then and then I was sick. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go back to a serious um topic because we we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is <laughs> what is one piece of conventional advice that you disagree with most strongly? Piece of conventional advice that I disagree with. Conventional, uh, yeah. Conventional advice. Oh, oh. Um, what are people advising people? Um, oh. Well, what, 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 what? Tell me a piece. What, what, what's a piece of what's a piece of conventional advice? I mean, what's what's what is someone what has someone offered you as a bit of advice? Well, <laughs> in my in my opinion, I think that's. The whole school system's a whole issue that's going on. I think that many people have told me that I need to get the best marks possible to achieve a level of success, which I think is same. The so same. So that was the same in my day. Yeah, I actually think convention. It, it maybe not so much advice, but I think you know that as an artist, I'm going to say 
that everyone at the moment is tending to advise you, me and everyone, this um, social media presence and reach and large numbers of followers and that that is necessary and that, um, you know, that that's the path um, that I, I, I think that that, really limits that really limits artists and younger artists who are born into the um social media and internet um age that it's that that advice and that that um that that is just limiting them that where they're not thinking oh what else could i do or what else is a path or what else is an option and 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 then so they so they so they've got limited op- well they think they've got limited options, and then when they don't achieve these large numbers of followings or something through the um, systems that they're applying, which is this, everyone's doing the same stuff, you know, everyone's doing a time lapse painting with a you know Fleetwood Mac song over the top of it or something, right? And then so every you know. <laughs> Everyone, uh, so yeah, the convention. The convention is funneling people, artists. We're talking about into systems of behaviour which are not allowing for their for 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 diversity of 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 methods and that. And yeah, that'd be that'd be it for me. Yeah. And are there some habits or skills one needs to develop that you would consider essential to becoming a successful artist? Um, um, I think, okay, I reckon habits, habits or skills for me. So again, it's all very depend for me. Um, the habits that I like to develop are the, the, the work ethic, the work, the work ethic is very, very important. There's a lot of people who think, others are genius or talented or something and then you'll typically hear a person that you look up to as an artist and they will say uh, one of them I remember was B.B. King the blues the blues artist B.B. King you know it's about work it's about it's about putting in the hours it's about it's about being diligent and being serious and committed and not sitting there, oh, everyone's got it easier than me or something, or I wish I was blessed with more skills or something. So so the, the work ethic is really is a huge um uh a huge thing that 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 that, that, that I, I acknowledge in my practice and also probably a balance that I find the art the art practice forces you to address balance in your life. So if you're out of balance, you might be partying too hard, staying up too late, drinking too much or something, and now go to your art studio. You're not doing good work because you, 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 because of what you, you, you because of your behaviour in your daily life. So I find that the art practice forces, it, it calls your hand, it forces your bluff, and forces you to to sort out things in your life to make balance. That might be getting along with your partner, um, get health and um, well being issues. You might be eating poorly, drinking too much, whatever, hanging around the wrong people. I reckon the the art path is the it's 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 actually more than just drawing, painting, creating stuff. It's it, it calls you into addressing your whole life and balancing it. So that's a beautiful thing, you know, art as religion or art as way, you know. And if you could go back and say one thing to your 16-year-old self, what would it be? Yeah, probably stay at school two more years, <laughs> two more years. And everyone was saying, everyone was saying that to me, Brendan, it's two more years and you'll have so many more options and things. And two years seemed like two hundred years. You know, there was it, 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 it. Yeah, if I could go back and say something to myself, I'd say, you know, stay at school and stop getting girls pregnant all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Control yourself, boy. 
<laughs> men det är vis fan, hej, det är vis fan. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me, and I mean, you've definitely inspired me along with many other teenagers who are going to watch this. Yeah. And as well as that, you've made me laugh. I mean, I've loved yeah, this interview. Great. So, so thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on, and um, yeah, it's great fun. Nice talking to you, mate. Yeah, definitely. You too. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. See ya.